Hello, we're going to get started with our next panel. And I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, we have Ray Lu and Bill Huang from our Beijing office. who are going to talk about the new privacy laws in China. And Ray is um, the, actually the head of our Beijing office. And Ray and Bill are my go-to people for PRC privacy and cybersecurity issues. Um, last year, Ray was named top 15 data privacy lawyers of the year. And Bill and Ray have really been keeping up with all the changes in China. So we look forward to hearing from them. Ron Moscona is a partner in our London office. And Ron and I have worked together for years on GDPR related issues. Um, and now UK GDPR. And Ron also works on technology transactions and agreements and intellectual property disputes. So welcome to the three of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will let you take it away from here. Hi, um, I will uh, just uh, say a few words uh, to introduce this next uh, session. Um, which will focus uh, on um, three jurisdiction, on, uh, jurisdictions on China, um, uh, the EU, and the UK. Um, so we, we, this, this part of the presentation will be uh, um, split basically to two halves. The, the China side, which will be presented by Bill and Ray, um, will uh, provide a very broad uh, picture on a lot of uh, new legislation that has been coming in uh, in China in the last uh, year or two, some of it in draft, some of it uh, already uh, uh, in place, but not necessarily entirely implemented. There's a lot of new things um, and a lot of uh, uh, new concepts to, uh, to learn and understand. So it's going to be um, taking in quite a lot and from a fairly uh, um, uh, high uh, point of view. Um, in, uh, on the, by contrast, uh, the second part, uh, uh, which focuses on developments in the EU and the UK will be much more narrowly focused uh, because uh, in the UK and the EU, not that much has changed since um, GDPR was introduced uh, uh, back in 2016. Uh, so the law uh, is, is quite uh, established. We, uh, many people are quite familiar with, uh, with it and we're not going to go through all of that. So we're going to focus on, uh, in particular on uh, developments uh, recently in the, in the area of uh, international transfer transfers of, uh, of data, which, as you will see, is also a very big element um, in the Chinese um, regulation of, of data and cybersecurity. So um, it, the, the issue of international uh, transfers of data is becoming increasingly a, a, a huge focus um, in large parts of the world. Um, so you, you will hear about quite a bit about that from both uh, the China side and the UK and the EU side. So. Um, uh, with with uh, nothing further, I will hand over to uh, Bill and Ray um, to discuss the uh, Chinese uh, developments in, in data protection and cybersecurity. Well, thank you so much, um, Ron and Jamie. Um, uh, my name is Ray Liu. I'm a partner and the uh, Beijing office head of Dorsey Whitney LLP. It's certainly my great pleasure and honor to share our practice, share our interpretation and, and analysis of the uh, latest data uh, privacy law and the the uh, law enforcement trends in China with the distinguished audience today. Uh, I, I I sort of like the um, the subtitle of um, our session, uh, extreme distance. That sounds like you know galaxy far far away, right? As that's a really a fancy subtitle. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, China is. Um, is a civil law country, um, is a sort of a centralized, taking sort of the top-down legislative approach. Um, you got a sort of a statutory legislative and the legal system. Um, but I think the, the galaxy maybe is not that far away uh, in, in two sense, uh, uh, or two, let's say in two folds. One is, you know, some of the fundamentals of the new data privacy law or the entire PRC data privacy or cybersecurity regime are quite similar to um, what have been already discussed in, in today's session, uh, including, let's say, you know, sensitive data, um, data localization, cross-border transfer, you name it. And secondly, um, the new data privacy law regime has certainly a profound impact 
not only on Chinese companies, but also on you know multinational enterprises uh, based in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, and of course, there are foreign invested entities in China, including you know Wolfi, wholly foreign owned ent entities, uh, joint venture, even wrap offices, right? So so that's why we believe that um, it's it's certainly a a, a a right topic for us to share, and it's certainly a, a one of the most important. Um, um, a regulatory regime in terms of general corporate and regulatory compliance for you know multinational companies doing business in China. So um, next slide, please. Um, so let's um, let's um, jump right into it, right? Um, you know, given the time limit, we're gonna just start with sharing some of the latest uh, legislative. Um, and um, um, regulatory changes, some, some of the new laws and new regulations that we need to uh, watch out for. Uh, obviously, since um, uh, June 1st, 2017, the enactment and uh, uh, effectiveness of the um, Chinese cyber, cybersecurity law, China has literally entered into a new era of um, cybersecurity and data privacy um, uh, regulatory compliance. Um, um, so um, I think after that, we have seen Quite some implementary implementing implementation rules, some provisional rules uh, being uh, uh, released, but nothing that has caught the uh, audience that much of attention because there's not much of the implementation rules uh, that actually got passed and and enacted um, uh, after the two years of the uh, the you know, uh, the enforcement uh, and the effectiveness of the uh, cybersecurity law, but uh, since 2021. You see that, uh, as shown in this in this slide, there's a wide range of new laws and regulations. Uh, you know, we call it draft law, but actually, if you take a look at the effectiveness date of these rules, all of these have already taken effect. For example, data security law is is a, is a big one. It regulating you know the data processing in mainland China primarily, together with other rules, um, the, the regulations for crit critical information infrastructure (CII) is a long overdue one, which has already taken effect as well, and several provisions on the auto uh, automotive data security management for trial implementation, what we call ADSM provisions, which is actually the, the, the first industry or sector specific regulation after the, uh, the enactment of the, uh, the data security law. So it's certainly uh, something worth watching, especially you know, for, as you can think about you know, what is hot in the automobile industry, by right? certainly EV, right? Uh, the, all of the electronic vehicles, et cetera. So they collect huge amount of data um, you know, uh, for the, the, the drivers to, to navigate the, the, the EV. Um, and also uh, PIPL, which is absolutely the star in the room. It's, um, I think, I think it's, it's, it has already achieved a certain level of fame as CCPA and GDPR, but not there yet, but is getting some momentum right here, right? And especially um, there's a wide range of um, legal requirements that we will further elaborate in the session later that will impact the multinational enterprises and businesses, especially the extra extraterritorial effects uh, and aspects of the, uh, the, uh, of the PIPL. Cybersecurity review measures, um, which is also an important one, um, um, especially in latest year, um, Article 7 of that particular measures attract a lot of attention globally. Um, it, it basically uh, requires uh, that for IPO projects uh, in foreign countries by you know, you know, network um, platform operators based in China who possess personal information of more than 1 million users shall take sort of a mandatory filing for review to the regulator. So that has a huge impact on Chinese companies getting listed in, in, in overseas at capital markets, let's say in, in, in the US um, and in UK. Um, and administrative provisions on algorithm recommendation for internet, uh, which is also um, an important one um, because it literally means that China has entered into the era of algorithm governance or algorithm regulations. Um, it, I would say it has a sort of a profound and groundbreaking impact uh, on the particularly the information uh, uh, industry and the information service sector, uh, regardless of the size of the players and the, uh, uh, the internet companies. Uh, it, it prevents the abuses of the um, 
uh, the algorithm prohibits activity that use the algorithms to you know disseminate misinformation and they give the you know the users some autonomy and some transparency um so i think i think all of these are a good momentum and certainly it, it you know it um it has a, you know it, it sort of increased the burden of compliance uh for the players and and the market players um for sure um next slide please so in terms of the uh the trends of law enforcement, uh, we have seen a quite a busy year. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, the cybersecurity review measure has uh, has some ripple effect on Chinese companies raising capital in foreign uh, ca capital markets. You know, Didi Chuxing's event is certainly uh, a, a big one because it, uh, it's a uh, it's basically Chinese Uber, right? It's a, a ride and taxi hailing service, it's a huge one, collecting massive data. Um, it, it was also a successful story. Um, it went IPO, but four days later, it got probed by the Chinese government for um, you know, potential violation of um, cybersecurity law together with other regulations um, for quote unquote transferring data out of China. Um, so you, you, you literally have seen and a, a, a vivid example of a Chinese company, an uh, international one, who got stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because on one hand, US regulators say, you know, you have to disclose this and that. Um, there's a bunch of requirements for you to comply with in order to get listed in, in, in NASDAQ, uh, in, in your stock exchange. On the other hand, there are increasingly um, scrutinized regulatory regime in terms of data privacy, cybersecurity um, related areas. So um, I think that's something that we have to pay close attention to, not only for Chinese companies, but also for foreign invested entities, um, uh, companies processing large volume of you know, sensitive data in China and supplying products and services to uh, critical uh, inf information infrastructure operators in China may also subject to, uh, you know, or get impact uh, by the cybersecurity review, right? And and also um, some of the foreign banks who also got you know penalized or fined for violation of data protection law, uh, which we'll explain a little bit further um, in, in the session. Uh, for example, Bank of East Asia and Standard Charter, they got fined for, uh, for improperly handling uh, quote unquote uh, credit information. Next slide, please. All right. Um, Seven things to know about PRC data protection law. Uh, yeah, I love the, the the lucky number seven, right? Uh, for example, uh, one of the books I love is uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Colbert, right? Um, so I'm a big fan. There's millions of uh, readers uh, in China. So we want our audience, uh, the distinguished guests, to be highly effective in terms of navigating the Chinese regulatory system, which getting increasingly difficult and complex. Um, so first of all, let's look at what rules are actually binding here, because you've been seeing, oh, PIPL, and there's another implementation rule, uh, there's another draft circulated for public comment. So what actually are binding? What are they? What are the, the structure uh, of the, 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 the authorities, right? So we have a three tiers, or we, we would make it simple to understand. We list the three categories here. One is obviously the effective laws and regulations, right? So, so you see that the you know, cybersecurity law, uh, data security law, PIPL, these are the three fundamental laws passed and enacted by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. So these are the top level uh, national laws, right? So they are, uh, they are absolutely binding. And we got draft laws and regulations as well, especially the two important ones that we listed here, uh, draft measures for security assessment of outbound data transfer, um, and um, uh, draft regulations on online data security. Um, all of these two are very important in terms of um, navigating the cross-border data transferring regime and the related um, um, uh, regulations and restrictions. Even though these two draft measures or draft regulations are not effective, not binding yet, but um, based on what we have learned that um, you know, a lot of the players and internet companies, they have already tried to comply with this. They have adopted modules and, and mechanism and policy to, to adopt this because, um, you know, there's no transition period embedded in these drafts. Uh, we can foresee that these two um, measure, draft measures and regulations 
will possibly uh, become effective uh, shortly this year, uh, if not longer. So um, I would say the contents there and the rules there are pretty highly reliable. So I think the companies and uh, market players should uh, you know, take proactive measures and actions as early as possible. And then there's national standards uh, promulgated and uh, created by uh, the State Administration of Market Regulation and National Standard Management Commission. Um, they're not laws, they're not binding, but they are very useful. And um, we basically have to refer to them when we draft consent, when we draft the policies for multinational companies um, and some of the service provider, right? Like a forensic firm, um, you know, service provider, they, they basically have created compliance software based on that. So these, these national standards are also helpful, right? Next slide, please. Okay, uh, who are covered, right? Who are covered? Obviously, you know, data processing within mainland China. Right uh, for organizations, individuals handling data within the territory of mainland China, obviously they are covered, um, but there is also an extraterritorial reach, right? Which is sort of similar to well, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, wrong uh, to GDPR, right? So um, the, the 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 Article Two of the uh, Article Three of the PIPL provides that overseas companies. Um, and individuals that handle personal information of individuals in mainland China, if one of the three conditions met, there is going to be extraterritorial reach. Um, the most two uh, important ones are the purpose is to supply products or services to natural persons located in mainland China. For example, you know we literally market towards Chinese-based customers, right? We adapted, you know, Chinese version of software uh, policy, marketing materials. Um, so we, our purpose is clearly to sell products and services to China, China-based clients, right? And the second one is the activities of natural persons located in mainland China are analyzed and evaluated. For example, let's let's say health, um, or you know, exercise, physical exercise app, or health app diet tracking app, right? They clearly track and analyze the biometrics and some other personal information. And obviously now these are seemingly uh, or uh, you know, presumably sensitive data uh, to begin with. So um, that will grant uh, a sort of an extraterritorial reach of PIPL towards the market players um, and, and the, 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 the organizations. Um, and, and of course, you know, where overseas data handling might undermine national security, public interest, or legitimate rights and interests of citizens or organizations, it will apply as well. Next slide. Three, what types of data are protected? Right, you, you, you begin to see that in 2021, when you see there's a wave of new laws and regulations, the regulators, uh, the CAC uh, and the central government and all kinds of um, legislative um, bodies and agencies, they collaborate. So you see that there's some level of consistency in terms of the definition of data, right? So obviously the most important one is the data itself. Uh, data means any recording of information by electronic or other means, Article three of the data security law. And here comes the personal information defined by PIPL all kinds of information related to identify or identifiable natural persons that is electronically or otherwise stored, right? Excluding anonymized uh, information. So you see that there's a sort of an overlap between the data and personal information, understandably. And here comes the important one, sensitive personal information, right? Then once again, that's a sort of a common concept shared by, um, you know, a variety of US law, let's say Colorado and Virginia as well. Um, it is certainly a very important definition um, for, 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 for the company who to try to comply with a new law. Um, it, it actually gives the adverse consequence if this is violated or if the, the information is leaked or misused. That will cause you know, harm and personal property safety risks, right? And also it, it gives some examples of what you know, qualify or what could be defined as sensitive personal information, which includes biometrics, religious beliefs, specific identities, medical and health, um, financial accounts, uh, location tracking information, of course, and you know information from the miners. So, so these 
definition, this definition is, is so important because it matters a lot, right? Because according to Article 29th of the PIPL, you know, special consent or, or separate consent need to be obtained uh, if you know a, a, a player is 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 handling sensitive personal information, and also it, it has a, some have some impact on the outbound or cross-border data transfer mechanism. For example, if you're handling like over uh, 10,000 uh, and plus um, uh, sensitive personal information, you have to um, uh, submit um, a, a security appraisal to the provincial level of CAC uh, as, as, as mandated by the rules and the draft rules. Uh, next slide, please. And what types of data are protected? And here are some additional definitions uh, given the time limits, you know, we won't be, uh, you know, fully elaborate on this point, but it's, it's important to know that um, the outbound data transfer draft security assessment measures um, uh, and provides that, you know, the important data, certainly it is important to the national security, public interests, um, et cetera. It has a very clear definition and um, uh, enumeration of, a variety of scenarios or a variety of categories of the important data that um, you know the government deemed that a violation or um, tampering or leakage of the, the of those might cause harm to national security and and public security. Uh, public security. Um, I, I won't read through all of this, but it is is important to know that the government data, work secret, and law enforcement data are ones, um, and the genetic data. Um, and biometrics are certainly ones, and that matters a lot, especially uh, when it comes to the uh, cross-border license and collaboration deals uh, for bio biotech and healthcare companies, because there are a lot, right? There are a lot going on uh, in the biotech world. So there's like a collaboration between biotech companies in the US and China, there are loads of loads of clinical trial data being shared, et cetera. So this has to be, uh, has to be clear. So when we have this type of collaboration and license deal, you have to perform, you know, this type of um, uh, uh, data privacy uh, regulatory check and possibly an export control check as well, right? From both the U.S. side and also China side. Core data, I won't elaborate, is defined in uh, Article 73 of the draft um, online data uh, security management regulations, and certainly stringent rules um, would be applied to the important data and core data. Next slide, please. All right. Um, four, whether informed consent is required. I think since um, November 1st, 2021, the, the, uh, the, the effective date of the, uh, the PIPL, we have been approached by a, a wide range of um, multinational enterprises regarding, oh, what informed consent uh, need to be uh, gained or required uh, or, 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 or obtained and what rules to follow? Is it gonna be informed? What, what means we said informed um, and, um, um, and, and, um, and particularly whether separate consents are needed and what are the rules regarding those? So um, without further ado, um, going forward, I will turn to Bill, uh, our uh, compliance specialist, my great colleague in Beijing, who will take it over from here and to tell us more about what informed consent is required. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Um, so um, hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Bill Huang. I'm an associate from um, the Beijing office of Dorsey and uh, as Ray and Jamie mentioned, I regularly um, assist uh, multinational clients in handling data privacy issues in China. And um, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here and do the webinar. And I will take over the torch from Ray and continue to share our experience and knowledge um, with you regarding you know, um, the new um, data protection laws and legal development in China. Um, so Ray already um, touched upon, you know, uh, what rules are binding and um, uh, who are covered by, you know, the PRC data protection law and um, what type of data is protected. And the next question is um, regarding um, what are the compliance measures required and how we can ensure compliance. So informed consent is one of this, these issues we need to consider 
And um, um, as Ray mentioned, uh, um, so after the PIPL um, has entered into effect, um, I think this issue has become um, uh, very, very important. And we received ma many inquiries from our client regarding you know, the consent requirement, the separate consent requirement. So um, as a general rule, um, the consent is um, required for you know, any type of handling for personal information. And handling is broadly defined by the PIPO, um, which will include basically all sorts of data processing activities like collection, storage, use, um, transmission, um, editing, um, provision, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, we need to um, obtain consent from the data subject before we, um, before we carry out any data handling activities. But there are some you know, exceptions on their PIPO. So we have listed them um, on this slide. Um, so um, uh, in short, um, these exceptions include like performance of contract and HR management, um, performance of um, statutory duties and obligations, and the need to respond to you know, public health emergency um, and, or to protect the vital interests of you know, uh, individuals in China. Um, and also um, we um, informed consent is not required um, if there is public interest consideration or if um, the use uh, is um, the use concerns, you know, public available information and the use is reasonable. So the first of three exceptions, um, I would like to note here that there's one very important requirement. It's, um, it, it is that, you know, the, 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 the handling of data must be necessary to achieve these purposes. And the challenge here is uh, currently under, you know, PIPO or other laws or regulation, there's no clear rule regarding what is necessary, right? Um, so for example, um, when we talk about HR management, um, many multinational companies um, having presence in China may need to you know, transfer certain you know, HR data uh, from China to their headquarters. But is, is that necessary? Um, we can argue that, well, it's necessary for us to you know, carry out you know, um, our management or uh, business activities, especially when there's no as much department in, in China, right? Um, but um, the counter argument would be, well, you, you can hire a HR person or you can use those HR service companies in China and you can store the data in China, right? Without a need to transfer all of them. So it's difficult to uh, determine like what, what is necessary. And in that circumstance, um, the safer approach is to obtain consent from the data subject um, to ensure com compliance. And um, in terms of uh, um, collecting consent, um, so the next question is, um, what is informed consent? Next slide, please. Yeah. So there are two elements, informed and consent. Um, so informed, um, which is basically the disclosure requirement, you have to, you know, um, uh, clearly inform um, the data subjects um, of, you know, um, what type of information will be collected, you know, information regarding, you know, the handler and also the purpose for the, the handling and the retention period, uh, and also how, you know, the data subjects can exercise their data rights. Um, all those elements required by law must be covered um, in the disclosure. And the second requirement is that, you know, disclosure has to be made in conspicuous manner and which should be clear and understandable to the data subjects. Um, and um, um, in order to satisfy this requirement, um, companies may need to have um, Chinese versions of privacy policy in, in place. Otherwise, you know, the data subject can simply say that, well, I cannot read and understand English, so um, I should not be bound, right? Uh, the, the, the privacy um, notice or privacy policy should not be effective. So if, um, if you are collecting, China, uh, collecting data from China and you don't have any um, Chinese version of privacy policy, 
and it is probably uh, the right time to consider having one. Um, and the next element um, is consent. So consent must be voluntary and explicit. Um, so which means that you, you need to allow the, the data subjects to select whether they will consent to the handling or not. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and as Ray just mentioned, um, under people for certain handling activities, separate consent is required. For example, if the company is going to share personal information with another, with a third party vendor, or if it is going to public, uh, publicly disclose personal information or handle personal, uh, sensitive personal information, or if there's the need to, you know, um, transfer personal information out of China, on these um, circumstances, you will need to obtain separate consent um, from the data subjects. And in terms of uh, what uh, is a separate consent, um, what should be, what its form should be like, and to what what content must be included. Um, currently, the law is silent on this. But well, uh, the draft um, ODSM regulation, online data security management regulation, uh, provided some guidance on this, um, and uh, which could be um, kind of burdensome. Um, if it is finally adopted. So this requires that um, the, uh, the handler uh, must uh, obtain consent for the processing uh, for each item of personal information in specific data processing activities. And uh, a one-time consent, a blanket consent for multiple items of personal information or multiple types of processing activities may not satisfy this requirement. Um, and um, um, since the, the, the regulation is still in draft form, we don't know like whether um, this rule will be adopted as um, it is currently stated. But if so, then um, you may need to review the um, consent question um, practice and to ensure that um, sufficient, separate, uh, sufficient separate consent is obtained. For, handle, for certain handling activities. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, the next topic is something I believe many of you um, are very interested in, and uh, it's about localization. And uh, um, localization basically means that um, the data will need to be stored in uh, mainland China unless um, the company can, you know, complete um, the procedures uh, required by the government, including the um, security assessment for the outbound transfer, and, and um, uh, we need to get an approval from the government for the transfer. Um, so the question will be, what kind of data will be subject to the localization requirement? Um, so um, there are basically four types of data. One is the um, personal data or important data um, collected or generated by CIIO, which is critical information infrastructure operators. So these are typically um, those uh, um, entities or organizations in certain important and sensitive industries like finance, um, healthcare, um, energy, transportation, national, um, uh, national defense, um, so if you are in any of these industries and you collect uh, uh, personal data or, da or important data in China, then um, you, you, you probably will need to consider uh, compliance with the um, um, security assessment requirement and the data localization requirement. Um, but we have heard that, uh, you know, the the local governments are required to, you know, uh, make, make a list and identify what kind of en entities are CIIOs. And uh, we, we heard that um, if a company is a CIIO, they probably will receive notice from the government. So if so far um, you have not received any notice from the government, then that is good news. But um, to be safe and to be prudent, um, it is better to consult with, you know, uh, your legal advisor in China um, regarding 
um, whether you might be regarded as a CIIO. Um, so that is number one. And number two, um, um, if uh, you know a company um, handles personal uh, data that reach a certain quantity or certain threshold, then it will be subject to the uh, uh, localization requirement. So um, um, similarly, there's no uh, detailed guidance regarding this, this issue that are binding, but the draft security assessment measures provided some you know, guidelines on this issue. Um, so um, instead of reading these um, provisions, I would just uh, I'd use some uh, examples. Um, so if, for example, a company uh, handles um, uh, personal information um, for you know, a very large uh, user base, for example, uh, with more than uh, 1 million um, users, um, then any outbound transfer of personal information, any, there's no like quantity for, for the transfer. It's the quantity is for, you know, your user base. If you have, you know, 1 million users um, in China, any transfer of data uh, will be, um, will have to go through the uh, security assessment procedures. Um, so this is number one. Number two, um, if a company uh, transfers um, personal data um, of 100,000 people or transfer sensitive personal information of more than 10,000 um, people um, in, get, in aggregate in any time period, um, then such transfer will have to you know, go through um, the um, security assessment. Um, so again, these are, uh, man, uh, these are merely draft rules and we don't know whether uh, they will be adopted. And actually, you know, the uh, one drafter um, regulation that is issued after the job security assessment measures provided, you know, different rules and basically um, take out, uh, you know, um, the second uh, scenario, um, that is the 100,000 uh, or 10,000 um, data scenario. Um, it only keeps the first scenario. So it's unclear how, you know, um, the, the, the regulators, um, will, what will be their final decision on this issue. And uh, it's, it's worthy to keep a close eye on it. Um, so this is number two. And number three is about important data. So uh, in simple terms, any important data, um, if you need to transfer them out, then you have to you know, go through the um, security assessment procedures. And the last one is you know, um, it's a cash haul provision. And an example is um, for credit information collected by banks or financial institutions um, as a principle, they need to stay in China. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we have talked about the localization requirement and the next question is um, like how we can transfer data out and what are the conditions and the requirements. Um, so there are a number of you know, um, conditions and uh, procedures to be met and completed um, in order to transfer data out. And the rules uh, may be different depending on whether the data is subject to the localization requirement. Um, so um, first of all, um, if you want to transfer data out of China, um, you need to have a genuine business need to do that. And second, um, yeah, and, and second, for data subject to localization requirement, then as I just mentioned, uh, you have to pass the security assessment and for data not subject to localization requirement, then um, you should either do the uh, security assessment or you should obtain a certification or you should have a, a, a contract uh, with uh, the following recipient uh, based on a standard form prepared by the CAC. But currently there's no um, um, standard form issued by the CIC, CAC and also um, there's no um, clear guidance on how the protection certification should be done. So it remains unclear. Um, it remains unclear uh, whether, um, how um, these conditions can be met. 
So um, it really depends on you know the type of um, data to be collected and the nature of the handler. If there's if we believe there's high risk, we probably want to consider the security assessment, right? Um, if you know we believe the risk is relatively low, then um, we probably um, want to, um, uh, we, we may probably consider, you know, uh, concluding a contract um, in, in, you know, our own forms. Um, okay, so um, next one, data covered by international treaty or agreement. Uh, this is merely a channel uh, provided by the jobs uh, ODSM regulation, but since currently there's no um, international treaty or agreement in place. I'll just uh, skip this. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, there are some other compliance measures to be taken for cross-border border data transfer. Um, so I will not um, discuss all of them. I, I would just, um, it is important to know that um, there's a security impact assessment for cross-border data transfer, which is similar to, you know, the uh, impact assessment under GDPR. Um, and uh, currently there's no um, detailed rules regarding how this assessment should be done, but there's a national uh, standard regarding this issue. And so we may use that as a reference for compliance measures. And um, so there's another issue regarding cross-border transfer for, you know, overseas um, legal proceedings. And uh, this is different from what I just mentioned. The other cross-border data transfer, um, they are uh, for mainly for business reasons, right? But if, you know, the, the purpose for the transfer is for a legal proceeding uh, outside China, then um, apart from all these requirements, I just mentioned um, the, 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 the transferring party will also need to, you know, um, follow the procedures under the international treaty on judicial assistance and seek approval from, you know, the competent authorities in China, which is you, uh, the Ministry of the, uh, uh, Justice um, in China. And Next I will slide, also, right, also quickly add that, you know, the, the, the law pro provides that without approval of the central authority, no personal information or data uh, may be provided uh, that, that are stored in China uh, may be provided to uh, foreign judicial body or law enforcement authorities. And there's a consensus reached uh, by the legal community within the legal community that typically in respond to um, a, a document request voluntarily, that should be generally fine. But if um, a party is compelled by the court uh, or to respond to a law enforcement um, mandate, uh, that might be different. But obviously uh, all the uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the state secrecy review and the personal information review um, and assessment have to be completed uh, uh, as well. So uh, just to quickly add to that, yeah, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, so, so, um, so what if there's any uh, non-compliance? So what are the potential exp exposures? Um, so um, the, the PIPL and um, other um, data protection laws have um, uh, listed a number of you know, um, penalties. And these are actually the ammunition that Chinese government um, can use to uh, ensure compliance and to um, you know, um, punish those um, violations. Um, so um, there are several um, um, penalties that are potential legal consequences that are noteworthy. One is the fine on organization. And you can see that this could be uh, very high. It could be up to, you know, around US dollar um, seven to eight million or uh, up to 5% of the revenue of the company um, in the previous year. And uh, um, the, the tricky issue here is that there's no um, um, detailed rule regarding like how the revenue will be determined. So it's unclear whether the revenue will be the revenue of the, the you know, handling company or will be, could be the, the entire group, um, um, the, the revenue of the entire group. 
um, which is uh, which remains to be seen. Um, and another noteworthy issue is that uh, people also would impose um, penalties on individuals. Um, so for example, there could be a fine up to um, uh, 150,000 US dollars. And also, you know, the responsible individuals might be blacklisted, which means that they may no longer, they may um, not be able to take any senior executive, executive or data protection positions uh, in China during the blacklisting period. Um, okay, so, and uh, there's uh, one last issue I want to note on, you know, the legal liabilities, which is that, you know, different laws and regulations have set out, you know, different um, uh, liabilities, um, but, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, these laws and regulations may um, overlap, their scope may overlap. For example, um, if uh, there's a violation for, uh, of the rules for handling credit information, it's also very likely um, there's a violation of the BIPO because credit information um, very likely will contain personal information, right? So the authorities will have um, the discretion to select uh, you know, the, the, the weapons um, they want to use um, that will be you know, sufficiently deterrent um, and effective. And one example is, is what Ray just mentioned. So it's about you know, the case enforcement action against uh, BEA and Sander Chartered. And uh, it's very likely that um, these cases, uh, the penalties, um, were based on, you know, PIPO instead of, uh, you know, credit information regulations. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, some key takeaways. Um, um, I will quickly wrap up. So, um, you know, there are new laws and uh, uh, enforcement change in China, and uh, which means that, you know, the Chinese government is paying closer attention to, you know, uh, data protection and data prote processing activities. And, uh, you know, the PRC law might apply uh, to, you know, multinational companies with operation in China or those without operation in China. Um, and a wide range of data is protected under PRC law and the rules may be different depending on the type of data involved. And informed consent is usually required and uh, uh, the privacy and consent form need to be properly prepared to satisfy you know, the unique requirements under PRC law. Next slide. And uh, you know, certain type of data must be localized on that unless there's approval from the government. And even for data not subject to the localization requirement, a number of conditions and procedures must be met. And failure to comply with BIPPO may result in significant penalties and liabilities. Therefore, um, it is important for companies to, you know, keep a close eye on the um, development of laws and regulations in China and formulate uh, compliance policies and build a compliance system that is compliant, practical, and cost efficient. So um, that is all for you know, uh, for the for the China part and. Uh, uh, I will pass the microphone to um, our colleague, uh, Ron, um, in our London office. Thank you very much. Ron, please. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Thank you, Ray. That was uh, very interesting indeed. Lots of new stuff to learn about. Um, so uh, we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'll just mention, as Ray said, there's uh, um, obviously a lot of overlap, a lot of similarity between um, some of the uh, rules uh, that are introduced in China. They're obviously echoing uh, a lot of the rules that we have under GDPR and also in the US in various at various levels and in, in, in a lot of the content is quite similar, for example, in relation to uh, sensitive data in relation to international transfers um, uh, and, and uh, requirements for consent. I mean, there are obviously differences. I, say, I think one of the glaring differences uh, for, 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 in practice for, for uh, international enterprises doing business across uh, jurisdictions is that I think there will be a more extensive requirement to uh, uh, obtain consent from uh, data subjects uh, under the Chinese law. There's the, the more uh, broader exceptions uh, for, for those uh, requirements on, uh, under GDPR and I think also under the US rules. So there's going to be more of an, an effort to get consents and uh, potentially also more 
issues with uh, <laughs> user fatigue over consents and all of that, but this is this is the way it is. Um, interestingly, on on the uh, um, uh, there's no there's no requirement in the under GDPR for uh, data localization, but there are uh, very significant uh, issues around international transfers, and that is the hottest issue at the moment. And uh, I think one of the things that we can see from from Bill's and uh, and Ray's uh, presentation that uh, in China, in addition to the same kind of issues and themes that uh, we see under GDPR and, uh, and and the US rules, there's obviously also an element of uh, in in Data protection and cybersecurity um, uh, uh, legislation uh, that has an eye on uh, national interest, on uh, uh, national security issues, um, which is not something which is an element of GDPR or, or the US regulations, which certainly GDPR is entirely about protecting the individual uh, and the individual's interests of privacy against uh, misuse of the of the data and the and the privacy by organizations and indeed uh, by the state. One of the things that a lot of people don't quite realize is that GDPR in particular has been drafted very, very much uh, with an eye on restricting the states, uh, the, the, the national governments and the local governments and all of that in the way, because these are the organization, organizations that hold most data, more than private organizations. And a lot of the compliance efforts um, and uh, enforcement are actually against state organizations um, uh, for the protection of, uh, of individuals. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that um, the, the, the main point about the restrictions about in, on international data transfers from a GDPR point of view uh, is all about protecting the uh, interest of the individual. And the reason is the concern that once data um, travels outside the jurisdiction, uh, the uh, uh, it escapes the, uh, the 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 legal restrictions that the, the, the law, law imposes uh, imposes and uh, and uh, the individual data subjects lose their legal legal protection their ability to make complaints or to have uh, regulators intervene or to use the courts and all of that and that is fundamentally the reason for imposing restrictions on international data transfers and um, that has always been part of GDPR it has always been part of data protection rules in the EU even under the old uh, directive that goes back to the 1990s, and uh, it was always uh, the philosophy that uh, to allow international transfers of data to countries that provide adequate protection. So uh, the EU has always been in the business of uh, assessing other pe other other countries' laws and deciding whether the laws of other countries provide adequate protection for uh, privacy interests. And very few countries have managed to to reach that uh, the, the point where they can be recognised as uh, providing adequate protection. Um, some of the main ones are Canada, Japan, uh, Argentina, Israel, not many others really. Um, and, uh, and now the UK, <laughs> thankfully after Brexit, I mean, one of the big uh, questions relating to uh, Brexit, uh, one of the first things that came up, um, one of many of course, is uh, what happens to data, um, uh, data flows between the EU and the, and the UK. So immediately upon Brexit, the UK um, announced an, a recognition of the EU as, 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 as providing um, adequate protection, so there's no, there hasn't been any restrictions on transferring data from the UK to the EU. Um, it took the EU a little bit longer, of course, it has less in incentive to uh, to make life easy for um, anyone to do with the with the UK as a result of Brexit. But uh, uh, only a few weeks ago, um, finally, it gave um, the, the 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 final permanent um, recognition of the UK as providing a. Uh, uh, adequate level of protection, and that is important. It's important for U.S. businesses uh, and organizations if they have an operation in Europe, an operation in the U.K., and that operation at least doesn't need to worry about data transfers between, you know, Dublin and London, uh, you know, if they, or between, you know, Berlin and uh, and 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 Glasgow. Um, at least at that level, there's free flows of data between the EU and the U.K. as long as the U.K. doesn't. Uh, introduce massive um, uh, changes to its own data protection regime. Politically, um, the Brexit movement uh, is obviously very keen to relax regulations, very keen to move away from European standards. And there's a lot of talk about um, introducing changes to UK GDPR. Um, as, as I'm sure um, the audience uh, is aware, um, one of the fundamental aspects of Brexit was uh, that uh, when, when the UK left the uh, EU, uh, it adopted all of the existing laws um, of the EU as they were 
um, uh, to, to allow for continuity. So, you know, the minute after Brexit, the laws in the UK were exactly the same as they were a minute um, before Brexit. Uh, but the, 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 the prospect of divergence uh, over time um, is, is very much there and is very much uh, part of the mission and, and purpose of Brexit. So there is a, a possibility that the UK will push the envelope a little bit and, and make changes uh, to its uh, um, data protection regime, perhaps to make it a little bit more user friendly for, for organizations and, uh, and the government and all of that. And, and there is a risk that if they do that, the, the, the EU may indeed rethink the uh, um, uh, adequacy decision in relation to, to the UK. So at the moment, the adequacy, adequacy decision was adopted for a period of four years. I want to talk a little bit about data transfers because some things uh, evolved and changed both in the UK uh, and in the EU. Uh, so um, uh, again, keep, keeping in mind that the main purpose of the restrictions on, on international transfers is to ensure that the uh, uh, data subjects, um, whether they are EU or, or residents or UK residents, or indeed foreign uh, res residents uh, who have the benefit for one reason or another of, uh, uh, of the protection of the law, but for example, because the, the, the data controller sits in the, in the EU. Uh, the concern is that by transferring the data outside of, uh, of the jurisdiction, um, the individuals would lose their legal protection. Uh, there's there's a, an interesting question which hasn't really been resolved to this day, despite many, many years that this issue has been on the, uh, um, uh, as part of the legislation, which is what actually amounts to transferring data or exporting data. And there are two really strands. For, um, I think a lot of people think that it should be, it ought to be um, a question of who actually controls the data. Data is transferred uh, once it moves from an organization or uh, a controller that sits under the jurisdiction and subject to the jurisdiction of the relevant country, whether it's the EU or the UK, uh, over to a, uh, a controller or someone who controls the data um, outside the jurisdiction. So they they they're not really concerned about enforcement action by, action by 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 regulators. This is a fairly modern way of thinking. I think this is the perhaps predominant um, thinking in the UK about what it means to transfer data. <laughs> I think originally and and and, and probably most people still think of transferring data actually at the level of physicality. Uh, data sitting in Europe or data sit sitting on servers that are kind of like installed in, in, in Dublin or in, in Rome uh, uh, compared to, 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 to data sitting on servers that are sitting in um, Nevada or, or Alaska or somewhere. Um, um, and, and, and there's still, I think, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. I mean, the, 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 the European court has never really um, gave a decision uh, about what it means to transfer data or to export data. They, somehow everyone seems to skirt that very, very fundamental question and, and there's no real answer to it. So both elements still kind of linger, the, the, the element of uh, uh, <coughs> physical location, sorry about my coughing, physical location and, um, and control. Uh, so um, very quickly, um, the, the EU has uh, adopted a, um, a new set of, uh, of standard contractual clauses to transfer data contractually. Now, standard contractual clauses are, are not and never have been the sole um, legal basis for transferring data to countries which do not have the benefit of a adequacy decision. But as a result of a series of uh, court cases, which originally uh, struck down the um, uh, safe uh, harbor um, scheme, which which dominated in you know for the first 20 years or so of data protection regime, and then uh, when that was replaced by the um, um, uh, by, by, by the privacy shield a few years ago, which was a more robust uh, um, um, uh, system, um, that was also struck uh, by 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 the famous decisions in 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 Schrems too, um, and we, we we were left by uh, in a situation where the only practical way of transferring data. Uh, across uh, outside of the EU and the UK is to use the standard contractual clauses. Now, the reason that these, uh, 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 as I'm sure many in the audience would know, the reason the court struck out the uh, um, um, data shield and before that the, uh, or the privacy shield and before that the uh, uh, safe harbor scheme uh, has to do with national security, not the national security uh, of Europe, but the national security um, uh, operations, uh, signals um, 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 operations or signals uh, um, surveillance 
that is undertaken um, both by the US, uh, uh, well, by the US uh, um, security organization, by the NAS, NSA, and, and as it happens also by the UK, um, which uh, uh, has in developed a huge amount because uh, against the, the background of, of what is known as the war on terror. So that, that over the last 20 years generated a huge amount of, uh, uh, in parallel to the development of, of, of communication systems and um, social media and all of that, um, that developed into a, a very extensive operation of, of monitoring um, uh, electronic communications, pre primarily, of course, not exclusively, but primarily in order to identify uh, threats to national security and terrorism and all of that. And that all exploded, if, if, if for those of us who remember, in 2014 with the revelations of uh, Edward Snowden, who um, was a contractor for the NSA and uh, and, and revealed to the whole world the extent of the uh, uh, signaling uh, um, uh, surveillance operations that are uh, going on. And that um, uh, gave rise to both political um, uh, reactions in the EU, which was, I think, quite uh, offended for not being part of the party uh, and uh, not really participating in the whole thing, but also from the uh, uh, legal, uh, legal establishment and from uh, 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 privacy um, um, activists, and that generated the legal um, uh, 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 cases that that brought down the uh, the, the, the the safe harbor um, scheme, and later the um, uh, privacy shield. shield. So all of that uh, was uh, happened because of the concern that once data leaves the uh, the EU and goes into the US, it is becoming exposed to uh, unchecked. Uh, um, uh, surveillance by by U.S. authorities, and actually, one of the technical things that uh, mattered a lot for the for the for the EU court is that uh, whereas the U.S. law gives um, due due process protection to U.S. citizens in relation to this kind of surveillance, it, that protection doesn't extend to non-U.S. citizens, and that that clashes with GDPR rules, which mean which say that yes, you can access data and use it for national security purposes, but there has to be judicial overview. overview and individuals have to have the right to be able to go to court and and and, and defend their their privacy interests. So, so that's the background for all of this. Um, the new SCCs that were introduced by the EU in 2021 um, put an emphasis on that because uh, um, they 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 they, they recognise that as a result of the Schrems II decision that and that's the important thing that uh, SCCs, the standard contractual clauses that you put in place in order to transfer data from the uh, EU or the UK uh, outside uh, might not be enough. And that is the important thing. And next slide, please. Um, so what we see here, the supplemental protection measures may be required when using the SECs. And that is the big thing that came out of Schrems too. And that is the hot topic at the moment, which really is a concern for everyone and should be a concern for everyone. Um, it is built into the SECs and the, the modern um, version or the 2021 version of the SECs um, include an ex express warranty by the parties that the laws of the receiving country will not prevent um, the uh, parties from, from fulfilling their obligations under the SECs, which are obligations to protect the, uh, um, the, the, the private interests of the, uh, um, of the uh, data subjects. And um, um, these warranties are given under these SECs specifically by reference to supplementary protection measures that may need to be put in place in order to protect uh, the data against, amongst other things, um, uh, surveillance by, by national security authorities, or it could be many other things. Um, so uh, these things matter, and a lot of companies at the moment struggle with the question um, whether just to put in place SECs or whether they really need to put in place more serious uh, measures uh, to protect the data when it leaves the jurisdiction. And you can see at the bottom of this slide a few of the um, measures that are obviously, that can be can be used and that, that the ACCs actually uh, allude to uh, in the actual text and, and, and that, um, <coughs> that, that, that can be used in order to reduce the risk. And so quite obvious data minimization, so transfer as little as possible and, uh, and transfer data which is as rich, uh, as, as least rich as possible. Uh, adequate anonymization, um, proper uh, encryption and restrictions and all of that, and proper due diligence uh, to, to, to satisfy yourself that uh, when the data is going to the uh, other country, uh, it's, it's not going to be jeopardized. Um, next slide, please. 
Yeah, I'll just then mention that, that these things are important enough so that there's been in the last couple of months um, a few very important decisions uh, determining that using Google Analytics might be against the law because of data transfers to the US. And uh, Facebook is facing at the moment a provisional order by, uh, by the Irish um, data protection um, um, regulator prohibiting the transfer of data to the US. Facebook actually threatened to close down its services in the EU as a result. So we, we might be free from Facebook at last. <laughs> I didn't mean that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists. There's so much to know and learn about the developments in China and the EU and UK. So thank you for all that information.